Alright, follow me here for a second. Cinema is one of, if not the, biggest influences on the modern world since the creation of music. Movies have shaped culture for over 100 years now, the first screenings of a train blasting towards a projection board literally terrifying the people watching who had never seen anything like this before. And now, fast forward to 2024 and movies are, well, in a weird spot. Most big title major blockbusters are tied to franchises these days, and the cost to make one of them keeps inflating to prices that are actually impossible to understand. Like there's no way you can spend 300 million on The Flash and expect it to make that back. You gotta be stupid to think that's happening. And while I do think good movies are still being made, like I'm not a total doomer about the overall state of cinema just yet, there was a time period, the early 70s to 2000s-ish maybe, where movies transformed from the straight-laced mindsets of the 30s through 60s and became a modern wild west for filmmakers. This all of course due to a combination of the culture shifting across the world from things like the Vietnam War and a rebellious mindset spreading through the next generation. The stories creative people were wanting to tell changing and adapting with the world around them. On top of that, with the release and ease of access to video recording cameras, it didn't matter who you were, just go down to Sears, grab a camcorder and some blank tapes, film some bullshit, slap a sticker on it and bam you have a movie you can sell to anyone that will buy. Any average asshole can now become Mr. Big Shot Director Man. This, of course, leads to the creation of what would go on to be called B-movies, films that are made cheap as hell, probably quick as possible, and usually forgotten about just as fast. While a lot of young directors that would go on to become landmark names did make these types of low-budget movies themselves, filming their ideas with zero dollars and nothing but a few friends, there were just as many scam artists looking to make a quick buck on bad action and uncomfortable nudity, bogus-ass work out tapes and how-to tutorials that were virtually useless. There's whole channels on here dedicated to just these movies. You all know who Red Letter Media is, but for me personally, they've been a huge part of my life forever now. Watching these awful action movies and over-the-top horror ripoffs since I was young as hell with my dad and still doing it to this day, both with sleazy shit movies and real-ass independent creations. You know what I mean, grindhouse-type shit, 80s canon films, Neil Breen. B-movies are, for better or worse, art in some of its most raw and real forms. You can tell when a creator really did value the thing they were making. And even if it was weird, poorly made, violent, or even kind of uncomfortable at times, they had something they wanted to create and did it regardless of any rules or restrictions that traditional movies have. But anyway, I want to talk today about one of my favorite manga, a series that in itself feels like a B-movie from how unapologetic it is. A bloody, messy, horrific trip through hell while also having that same creative heart, that soul that's in some of those exact movies I've been showing off, and combining all of those elements together to make something that no other manga is even remotely like. Of course, I'm talking about Doro Hey Doro by Q Hayashida, the magic-based mystery that has quietly taken the manga world by storm, and for really good reason. So before we dive into the manga, let's first talk about Hayashida, Monthly Iki Magazine, and March of 2020. <laughs> Doro Hey Doro ran for a total of 18 years, starting in Shogakukan's monthly Iki on November 30th of 2000 and running there for 14 of those years. That is, until September of 2014 when monthly Iki was discontinued. After that, a direct replacement magazine was created called Hibana in 2015, that being where Doro Hey Doro was transferred to, before it closed down two years later in 2017, Doro Hey Doro being shifted yet again to Monthly Shonen Sunday, finally being allowed to complete its run at 167 chapters in September of 2018. The manga itself was created by Q Hayashida, and despite what people online and Google itself thinks, this isn't her. <laughs> Actually, she has no public name or pictures, Q Hayashida is just a pen name. But that doesn't stop people from posting this image of Natsuki Mariam saying it's her. 
out of all the mangaka I've covered so far, she's absolutely the most private with her personal life, and pro I can't blame her one bit. People get really weird about manga artists in general, so I imagine being a woman in that field is literal hell. Shout out my goat Paru Itagaki for getting married into chicken head. B-stars and Baki videos one day, they're coming, count on it. Now before starting Doro Hey Doro, Hayashida had attended an art university and majored in painting. With the idea of being a manga artist, something she had already kind of decided to do in her head. This university experience caused her to realize a few things about her art and about what she liked doing with that process, but uh, I'll come back to that later. And after graduating, had only done a few separate one-shot stories, along with one real publication, that being the two-volume series Machin X Another a manga adaptation of the Dreamcast game Machin X by Atlas, which is literally just an SMT game in both designed, sound, and creative team. As a manga itself, like, it's cool. Ties in with a game I've never played that was on the fucking Dreamcast, which I've only touched three total times in my life, so can't speak too much on it. What's funny to me though, is that with Machin X Another being her only major title, the very next thing she did was Doro Hey Doro, the series' very first page looking like this. For a lot of young artists getting their start in the real-ass manga world, their art is usually something that grows with them over time, eventually becoming the style they become known for. Meanwhile, Hayashida beats your ass in from page one with an almost unnatural level of detail and design, all coming from this big ass lizard head dude swallowing someone whole, and the next pages continue to go harder and harder. Sure, her art was already kind of at that level in those one-shots, but with this being her big-named first series in a monthly magazine that was all completely her creation, it blew the doors down and went on to become one of the most celebrated manga in the current generation that while not making infinite million bucks and selling more copies than God, it still has a large and very devoted following online. Her art speaking to tons of people just like me who adore whatever she's cooking. But enough of all this preamble, let's get in there and talk about Kaiman, Nikaido, and the first chapter. So back in March of 2020, a time I'm sure all of you just look back on with only the best of memories, Doro Hey Doro's anime was coming out in Japan. I had already been hearing about the series through Twitter osmosis, the insanity of the story, the over-the-top art and attitude, the genuine heartfelt writing it supposedly had, and kept it in the back of my mind until I saw this anime was coming soon. Now, during this time, the world was in the process of shutting down, so what better way to avoid thinking about the outside world and to stay in my own house than to read a story about someone else's hell world where people just show up in doors appearing from nowhere, experimenting with magical powers on whoever they see, then dipping out to go grab some dinner like it's another normal Tuesday. I went ahead and ordered the first volume, and on the day it arrived, I watched the first episode as well to kind of compare them. And while not disliking the anime at all, we'll talk more about that later, there was something that really caught me about that first page. All it is, like I had said, is an incredibly detailed lizard man biting down on someone's head. And I kind of just sat there for a minute looking at the saliva dripping from the lizard's mouth. The ridges all over his head, the spikes on the top, those black crosses on the eyes and thought, oh, fuck yeah, this is for me. Immediately buying volume after volume to be sent my way so I could see how this story was gonna unfold. Now back to the man stuck inside old lizard head's mouth, while he's trapped in there trying to escape, he sees what seems to be the shadow of a person inside of the lizard's throat mouth dimension, the shadow getting right into his face and telling him that he is not the one. And so, the big lizard pulls the dude back out, and after learning that the shadow in his mouth said this guy was not the one, grabs the knife from his belt and chop shops him into bits. The big lizard and his upbeat partner looking at the mess they created with some random guy's body, they just kinda say, eh, fuck it, and head on back home to eat some gyoza. This is Kaiman and Nikaido, our protagonist duo in this wild and violent world that is Doro Hey Doro. Kaiman, being a big lizard dude, wants to know why he's, well, a big lizard dude. With no memories of his past, Kaiman was found one day in an alley by Nikaido, 
laying there seemingly both headless and dead, before somehow just waking up with the head of a lizard when Nakaido looked away for a few seconds. The big lizard guy having no clue who or where he even is. Nikaido decides his name is Kaiman, named after a real-life Kaiman lizard, and lets him come on back to her shop for some gyoza. Yeah, if you can't tell, things happen kinda fast in Doro Hey Doro, and also, gyoza is a really big part of the story, which understandably so, this shit is magnificent. And from there, the story kicks off on a wild and unpredictable ride to discover the true identity of the Headless Lizard Man, the mystery of the plot being the main driving factor for the whole series. And while this first chapter does set the stage for the crazy bullshit that's about to unfold, in it you are specifically shown two of the biggest pillars of Doro Hey Doro that last from page one all the way to the last panel. And those are, without a doubt, the immaculate art drawn by Hayashida, and the series itself taking place in one of the coolest and most fucked up worlds ever put into manga. The moment to moment scenes in Doro Hey Doro being some of the most creative and interesting things ever put to page. Each chapter is a dive into this fucked up world where everything feels so scratchy, so filthy, so dark and violent. The characters all being drawn in ways to where they can look both gross, angry, or flat out evil, but also silly, stupid, and sweet. In Doro Hey Doro, there are two worlds, well, three technically, but one doesn't really matter as much, that being the human world and the sorcerer world. Hell is the third, but that, it's kind of its own thing, <laughs> along with three races of people appropriately named humans, who are just exactly like they sound, sorcerers, which seem to also be normal people but can use magical powers that come from a weird black smoke they create from their bodies. And lastly, there's devils, who are, um, well, well devils. <laughs> In the human world, it being called the Hole, people live in what is basically a huge and endless slum, a rotting, decaying city where its people kill for both scraps to survive and just in general because they're vibing. The Hole is dark, it's dirty, it's depressing. It's what your racist uncle thinks every country outside of America is like. Everything in the human world is seen to as the sorcerer's playthings. Them popping up in random doorways that appear from thin air and using humans as guinea pigs for their magic. Living in a whole other reality that can only be reached through the creation of those special doorways with that same magic. Meaning humans have no way to access their world, but sorcerers can come and go to the hole as they please. So between the locked off world, the lack of powers, and a sorcerer mob boss with a cleanup crew that I'll talk about here soon, keeping any uppity humans suppressed and unable to fight back, they live extremely short and shitty lives, each day possibly ending in death from who the fuck knows what. With that being said, you'd think the sorcerer world would kind of be the opposite of this, since they have magic and total control over the humans that are stuck in shit world. Surely they come from a high class society, right? Nah, their world's just as filthy, just as unexplainable, and just as violent. Despite all sorcerers having the power to use magic smoke, the ability and level of smoke varies from person to person. And with that smoke kind of being your label as a sorcerer, if your shit's weak, you get treated just the same as a human, like you're the dirt below some of more powerful's feet. Whether it's the whole or the sorcerer world, might makes right. And if you can't defend yourself from the fucked up magic of someone stronger, then you're pretty much done. This is the world Doro Hey Doro takes place in. One of brutality and harshness. A world that feels like anything can possibly happen as long as it's really violent and hella weird. It all communicated through her artwork in a way that honestly is kind of unlike any other artist in the manga game that I can think of. Like, I can make simple comparisons to something like Tsutomu Nihei and Blam. They both have that hyper detailed dark world with big violence and odd character designs, but Hayashida's art itself is in a whole weird ass galaxy of its own with the amount of craft and design in the ideas. The whole is full of decaying buildings, dirty hallways, and bloody alleys that are all created with this almost random seeming line work. 
the finer details of her drawings being full of what I would call sketchbook scratches. Like the things other artists refine out of their final product is a part of her final product. There are actually fully released sketchbooks by Hayashida that have tons of unfinished shots and concepts. You can buy them online. Showing off Kaiman's prototype design before he bulked up in the later chapters. And it really hammers home how much of her style comes from that hectic line work. Those pencil scratches and blotchy shadings. The almost unfinished look adding to the vibe of the entire world characters sliced and diced in a room that looks like if you yourself walked into it with a paper cut, your whole body would be exposed to every single infection going back from now to 10 million BC. You'll end up catching some shit that turns you into a swamp ghoul around here. Hell, chapter 42 is literally just discount the hills have eyes, but done in her style. Like it's a dirty ass Texas Chainsaw B-movie turned into a manga chapter. Shit whips so hard and I'll praise it until I'm literally dead in the dirt. This art style that makes up the world, of course, extends into the character designs, the combat, and even the story itself, both in tone and plot. The combat of Dora Hey Doro, just like with the art, is one of the biggest draws to the series for me, which was completely unexpected, honestly. When I saw the artwork Hayashida was cooking for minute one and how overly detailed and dense it could be, I figured most battles would just be big attacks that leave a person bloody and broken, and the minute to minute wouldn't be as important. And uh, I was wrong as shit. <laughs> Fights in Doro Hey Doro are play-by-play -play action scenes where every hit, every duck, dodge, and dive are all communicated extremely clearly and with this heavy sense of motion and weight. Like watching Nikaido spin around dudes and kick their shits in never feels confusing or muddled. And even with the art style keeping its abstract scratchiness during fights, it's smooth as hell and just as violent. Characters using both weird smoke magic and weapons like knives, hammers, skateboards, whatever they can get their hands on to beat their rivals to death in the most bloody way possible. Smoke abilities can be all types of wacky shit and fit directly into the vibe of the world. You can have the power to turn someone into a big meat pie or piles of mushrooms. You can use cooking ingredients or human body parts to create a living doll of another person, the doll targeting whoever it's a mimic of and tracking them down. There's a toothpaste tube guy who, by using a person's hair, can squeeze out of the top of his tube to make a perfect clone of them. But it's an evil as hell monster, so it can't actually replace them. There are more practical ones, like rotting away an enemy's flesh or restoring any physical wound back to full health. All the way to even straight up revival from death, like you just cast rays on them. Meaning that dying itself in Doro Hey Doro can be subverted, and that no matter how how violent, how brutal a battle can be, you can almost always bounce back somehow. These abilities, while just being all kind of weird in general, fit into the tone of the world perfectly. The magic itself being this extremely thick black smoke that can suffocate you just as much as it'll do magic bullshit to you. The sorcerers heading over to the hole to test their luck through the doors made of smoke. Each one kind of theming after its caster, and they all usually look cool as hell. Between these powers and the extreme combat, the series is fast-paced and brutal from start to finish, the fights always ranging from fun to fucked up, the levity of the dialogue and insanity of the world mixing together to make something that's just beautiful. But all of the combat aside, filling her wild story of smoke and violence are the actual characters themselves, which in my opinion, hand in hand with the art style, are the main draw of Doro Hey Doro. Going back to that first page again of Kaiman's head, you see from second one just how devoted Hayashida is to the level of detail she puts into her art. And this devotion to detail on the first page never slacks off. The art growing as the series progressed to honestly just increase and refine those exact things. When she was attending university, she mentioned that she hated the process of sculpting and that the clay itself was too smooth, like the detail you'd create doesn't really match a real human's features, but instead Instead, a perfectly smooth imitation. And bro, looking at every single one of her character designs, you can tell that's how she felt. 
From the outfits and masks to their actual human features, the cast of Doro Hey Doro are all extremely varied and interesting. Their clothes all dripping with excessive detail that keeps that same scratched and dirty vibe of the world taking the characters and letting them feel like they legit belong here. Shin's suit, tie, and Nikes. Kaiman's battle armor and cargo pants. Turkey's turkey mask. Their outfits all complement the honestly unique and weird way Hayashida draws humans. Her obviously loving masks as a design choice since both of her major series have featured them in some big way. There's an old review for Volume 1 of the Viz release where some dude says Hayashida doesn't understand human anatomy and complains her characters look bad. Which is one of the worst goddamn takes I have ever heard. Like, that's just broadcasting you don't understand art style and design. In Doro Hey Doro, you are either drawn one of two ways. The first being kind of normal looking, a standard body type. Maybe a little chubby, maybe smaller, thinner, but you know what to expect. And then you have characters like Shin, Kaiman, Noi, and In, people who I would say are built like brick shithouses. And this variation fucking rules, dude. If someone is made to be imposing, you know right away because they are 12 feet tall and wearing an outfit that looks like it was ripped from an Italian horror movie, where the smaller and more frail characters usually are left dealing with whatever insane bullshit the story throws at them. And their body structures fit every single part of this world narrative perfectly. You can complain they don't look like normal people, but honestly, they shouldn't. Oh, and you also have Johnson as well, who's just a big-ass cockroach with Nikes. Yeah, a lot of characters wear Nike Air Forces. You can find the almost exact ones online for big cash. And it absolutely adds a layer of flair that you wouldn't expect. The characters may be living in the filth dimension, but that doesn't mean you're about to catch their outfits lacking. Shin stays dripping with both blood and style. And lastly, tying all these unique and imposing designs together are the actual facial expressions and reactions the characters have. Them ranging from angry, demented, and just outright creepy to goofy, silly, and laid back. A character literally killing someone and then laughing at how silly their corpse looks. And it's almost never, like, mean-spirited? Like, the person who just gutted someone isn't a vile, evil dude. A lot of the times, they're a big-ass, goofy goober who immediately after mass murder go on to dinner parties where everyone is having fun being the biggest dipshits imaginable. And it's all coming straight from their heart. This aspect is an extremely large part of Doro Hey Doro, and it's one I'm going to come back to later. But for now, just know that even if this series is mud turned into beautiful, violent art, that doesn't mean there's no soul to it. Also, thinking back about those body types and outfits, Hayashida loves drawing big buff women that just also happen to get naked a lot. Now, I ain't pointing no fingers because I ain't no shit, but it seems like both Hayashida and I vibe with the same type of lady, ones that are strong and spunky, but will also kill me if I act up. Jokes aside though, sexuality in general is very downplayed in Doro Hey Doro, despite there being so much nudity, and I think it was a really smart choice, honestly. Doro Hey Doro manages to capture that exact grindhouse horror vibe with absolutely zero sexual weirdness, in spite of there constantly being naked women popping up. Hell, Turkey is trans since they can physically gender swap at any time, and Shota is debatably gay as hell for in. This shit is big inclusive and never tries to act like it isn't. It's just the way the world here in the whole works, and I fucks with that. Hayashida has said herself that shoujo manga isn't really something she finds herself reading as much and relates more to shonen series, both in their design and tones. Which, if you can't tell from Doro Hey Doro, that's pretty obvious. Nothing in this world is meant to be pretty or to have soft flourishes with heightened emotions. It's all grimy, raw, silly, and intense at the same time carving its own unique place in shonen manga while dancing around on the trends of demographics in general. And it rules so hard, dude. Moments where reality itself starts shifting to make no sense to the characters. Her conveying that feeling through weird, distorted paneling and layouts that, at least to my knowledge, are almost unlike anything anyone else has done in their manga. Hayashida taking a whole page and doing whatever the fuck she wants with it to get the moment's confusion across to the reader. 
Going back to what I said about her style compared to someone like Nihei and Blam, there's no artist out here whose art I'd say is super similar to Hayashida's. No other manga comes to mind when I think about things that are like Doro Hey Doro. She has no assistance, so everything you see is done by her and her alone. And to me, that proves more than anything else how both creative and unique her art, and by extension her series, really are. When it comes to Hayashida's style and how much I love it, there's no better examples to show than the over 100 color pages for Doro Hey Doro she had created during the series run. Them all eventually being compiled out into the 300 plus page Mud and Sludge art book. Oh, and uh, Doro Hey Doro translates out to Mud Sludge, which not only matches the art style and vibe, is a really smart foreshadow. So some behind the scenes info, when I make these videos, I usually try and find as many color pages for a series that I can for obvious reasons. But then you get to a series like this, where there's almost no way I'd be able to show them all off in a decent amount of time. Because every single month for 18 years, my girl was banging out beautiful drawing after drawing. Her using that painting degree from the university days to give them all these amazing colorings that seem so frantic but purposeful. Like she was just vibing with a brush and somehow made some of the most memorable color art for any manga ever. The layering, the watercolor finishes, the still over the top and extreme use of scratches and pencil marks. Dude, there's nothing else like her artwork and if you can't tell, it's the main reason I wanted to make this video. Shout out the dude Music Edge for scanning and uploading that art book online. He's also one of the main guys behind the JoJo Color Team scans, which are some of the most important things online for getting into my manga journey years ago. This video would not exist if those scans didn't exist first, so infinite props to him forever. These color pages in my eyes focus on what is most important about Doro Hey Doro, that being the characters themselves and how they all interact with each other. Of course, while also following that mystery the world has created for them, both with Kaiman's missing identity and just what the fuck exactly is going on with the Cross Eye Gang's boss, a group of sorcerers that have almost no magic ability, them being treated like dirt by more powerful sorcerers, the gang being led by an extremely mysterious beast of a dude who seems to somehow be connected to everything in the plot. So now, with that set up, I want to talk about four separate groups and how they all connect to the overall story in their unique ways, and how due to the nature of the mystery itself, it affects and changes each one of those groups. So for now, we're gonna go full spoilers until I talk about the anime and shit later on, so jump to this time here if you want to skip this. Cool. First up, when it comes to the series itself, Doro Hey Doro nails one of the biggest struggles that a lot of shonen manga have right off the bat, immediately proving that its character writing was gonna be a step above the rest, and it's shown off as early as the first volume with Kaiman and Nikaido, our two main leads for the series. Kaiman, like I had said before, is a big loud lizard headed dude with no memories of who he is, what he is, why he is, or how to fix the problem of him having said lizard head. And while the thrust of the story is always focused on trying to solve that riddle, that doesn't mean Kaiman can enjoy his daily life. Despite having a weird ghost living in his mouth that is seeking vengeance on the person who did this in air quotes because that can mean like four things for him, Kaiman spends his days with the person who found him headless in an alley, Nikaido, her running a gyoza shop called the Hungry Bug and serving up food to the people of the whole the two quickly becoming the best of friends and hunting down clues they can find on the Kaiman conundrum. Despite the hellish world they live in, the duo were almost always upbeat and energetic, both laughing and arguing with each other over the goofiest shit as they also happen to be literally gutting and flaying a sorcerer alive. Despite their goofy attitudes, the plot of the story is directly connected to Kaiman, and as they come to find out, Nikaido as well the mystery of who killed Kaiman going deeper and deeper with each layer, 
the connections to his former existence stretching throughout both worlds and kind of causing massive shit for everyone in the plot. His revenge quest causing him to both lose Nakaido and he himself die and come back and die again and come back again. But even as the sludge he's standing in gets deeper and thicker, he knows that he can always count on Nikaido to have his back. Her standing by the big lizard dude's side and kicking the asses of any sorcerer who stands in their way. And despite Kaiman having a long ass list of issues on what he even is, and Nikaido herself actually being a secret sorcerer who's going through the process of becoming a devil, the two are always the same best friends they are from the start, knowing that as long as they can tough this shit out together, there's Gyoza at the end of the tunnel. The two basically being like family members due to how close they are, how much they really rely on each other. And it's such an endearing relationship. Nothing romantic really or anything, just two good ass friends who stand together against both the most insane shit in the world and the wild ass people who fill it. And uh, speaking of that, next up we have the In Family, a group of Yakuza-like sorcerers that have banded together under the leadership of a dude named In, a ruthless gangster who, honestly, controls most of the sorcerer world through power and fear. When In was a kid, he had a comically tragic life that literally pissed him off so bad he took the world over, using his mushroom smoke power that is virtually unstoppable to beat the shit out of anyone who's been in his way and recruit an army of followers, a family of sorts. You have Shin and Noi, the heavy hitting cleaner duo who use their unstoppable teamwork to do any job In asks of them be it murder or judging a meat pie contest. There's Ebisu, the Hayashida self-insert who, due to extensive and reoccurring brain damage, is a goofy-ass gremlin that just wanders around the world, talking mad shit and, usually, finding new ways to hurt herself even more. You got Fujita, the nobody loser who's only in the family by luck. Him seeing his friend get eaten and sliced up by Kaiman in the first chapter, remember this page, and setting off the events of the story. There's people like Chota, Sho, Turkey, Judas's Ear, the varied and weird ass people who make the family's leadership up. And despite them being called a family, they kinda don't really care for each other all that much at first, Shin and Noi excluded. In is a mob boss with a crime time family, and despite him taking zero disrespect towards his name sitting down, he is still the guy at the top who gives orders without a care of personal well-beings. Ebisu is super self-centered and more concerned with doing whatever she wants than following orders. Fujita is just weak so no one cares about him. Chota is in love with In and hates anyone else who spends any amount of time with them. Like, they're all self-centered and kind of shitty. That is, until the plot kicks their mansion doors in and slaughters both most of the family members' grunts and in himself, leaving the remaining people to pick up the pieces, literally, and band together to stay alive as the cross-eyed gang takes over their city and hunts them down. During this long road of survival, having to play hide and seek with the boss of the cross eyes as they keep under the radar, and eventually leading to them all chopped up and as rolling heads, they realize how much they all have to rely on each other, how if it wasn't for their teamwork, the sludge of the whole would have swallowed them down and wiped the family out, them all going past even death itself to protect their own. And it's really cool seeing them all grow stronger together as this freak show fights back against the weird ass cross eye boss. Shin and Noi are obviously the two stars of the family, hell largely of the manga itself, and for good reason, they are easily the most striking and cool characters at first glance. But past that, people love them as much as they do because of their extremely strong and healthy friendship. Shin is only able to rush into unwinnable fights and destroy his body because he knows Noi has his back with her restoration magic. And even though Noi is built like a two-ton tank with probably the best character design of the last 30 years, she relies on Shin's level-headed orders to navigate through battle. 
knowing that, sure, she's strong and probably doesn't need Shin to survive, but she just wants to be there with her best friend and run jobs together, and that's all. It's not a sexual relationship, there's no real romantic tension, just best friends looking out for both of each other and the entire N family itself. And in opposition to N's family and their big-ass army of top-level hitters, you have the Cross-Eyed Gang, who, despite a goofy name, are low-level sorcerers that live in the slums of their world, beaten down and treated like shit by the more powerful smoke magicians in society. Despite their lower status, they make a living by selling black smoke as a drug like I had mentioned before, scraping by with what they can to make it day to day as they sit and wait for orders from their boss. A mysterious dude who wears an outfit similar to Kaiman and has the same build that has recently gone missing. <laughs> Due to their shit status and empty pockets, the main members of the Cross Eyes are extremely tight knit, them all working and living in perfect sync so they can stay alive and stay eating. <laughs> Since they're weaker than most sorcerers on a magical level, they all know how to fight and can handle any enemies the gang come across, using weapons where they're lacking in smoke, having to constantly stay on their toes and on the lookout for anyone that's got beef with them. But, despite them being fairly ruthless and desperate, one of my absolute favorite touches in the entire story comes from them. That being the fact that they are legit broke as hell, having to make a mad dash on recycling day to barter plastics for toilet paper, and them refusing to turn the house lights on until nighttime so they can save electricity. At one point, they find a room literally filled with gold in N's mansion and kind of just shrug at it, only to then find the janitor's closet that's full of cleaning supplies and shit bricks at the long-term money they're gonna save. Like, this is some of the realest shit in manga to date, I've lived the cross eye life and let me tell you, the best Christmas present I've got two years in a row are a year's supply each of toilet paper and paper towels, getting old is stupid as fuck. Anyway, eventually during their low budget survival, the boss shows back up and he brings the plot in with him. The gang being thrown into the middle of it and having to survive the extremely weird shit he's been cooking up, but always staying strong and level-headed because they have each other. Them already having spent the entire time surviving the hell of being broke together, which if you can overcome that, you can take on the world. I really loved this aspect, man. I grew up poor as fuck. We went years without cable or internet at certain points. No food in the house and wondering if the lights or water would be too expensive this time and get cut off. Off. So seeing that translated both realistically, comedically, and honestly all at once puts a big smile on my face. I love these losers so much. R.I.P. to Natsuki and Tan, somehow the only two characters to actually die in this story. And lastly, there's one more group who stands out in the middle of all of this mess. A group I've not really talked about much despite them being one of the more outlandish things in the series that kind of stand above everyone else. And that, of course, is the Devils, led by the top dog himself, Chitaruma. The world of Doro Hey Doro was already wild at first glance, but it was with the casual introduction to the concept of devils where I knew the series was really going to get out there. Them being nonchalantly tossed into the story, like seeing an embodiment of evil power is just a normal thing that happens here, and that's because it is. In this world, devils are the rulers at the top of the food chain, the most powerful beings in any of the three realms. They swoop in and out at their own leisure, doing literally whatever the hell they want and enjoying their lives since the power inside of themselves is so big and strong. Because of this, the sorcerer world basically worships the devils as their leaders, living under their total control since nothing can hurt them, physically or magically. Hell, at one point, you see death itself and think, oh damn, what's it gonna do? Only to see it just as wandering around town distributing flyers for its upcoming movie because death is just a normal character here, living its own silly life however it wants. The lore of the series does explain where they come from, the devils all being artificially made by Chitaruma, the only real devil, him doing it on a total whim just to have some fun and people to talk to for a while. But that doesn't really matter too much in my opinion, it's more about the fact that devils can do anything at all so long as Chitaruma himself is all cool with it. 
And in that framework, despite them being some of the weirdest and creepiest beings of the story, the devils are absolutely goofy ass dipshits who will do whatever they want as long as it just makes them laugh. To the devils, entertainment is the most valuable thing. They just happen to find violence and extreme pranks to be more fun than chilling out with the boys playing Katamari for five hours straight. And to find that entertainment, Chitaruma and the gang go to otherworldly lengths just so they can fuck with the cast. Solely for the reason of, <laughs> I bet this'll be funny as hell, and nothing else. The devils are, in my opinion, kind of exactly what Doro Hey Doro is all about in a weird way. These horrific, partially unexplainable beings that exist not to be evil or scary, but to just make themselves laugh and fuck around with people. Just like how the story in the world itself is dark and violent, but the people filling it are cheery and goofy. A perfect contrast that makes both the devils and the series itself hit unlike anything out there in the manga world. And this is the last thing I want to talk about. For as awful, violent, and angry as the world of Doro Hey Doro can be, it's also easily, without a doubt, one of the most lighthearted and goofy manga I've ever read. Through this whole video, I've obviously shown off how dark and gross this world can be, how mean and brutal it treats the characters in it. But the reason it works so well, the reason the cast is so beloved online and why this series is remembered so fondly, is because it's filled from top to bottom with absolute heart and love with goofiness and happiness. At one point in the story, Shin and Noi see Fujita being bullied by someone more powerful and take a stand to help him because he's a family member, he's their friend. Sure, they help him by Noi karate chopping a dude directly in half and Shin beating the other one with a hammer, Noi then grabbing the dude she split in halves parts and making a human sandwich from the guys they just slaughtered. Yeah, the violence is over the top and non-stop but it's countered right back with total heart and soul. This awful and fucked up world feeling like it does have big bright spots in it. That being the characters themselves and how they're all just living day by day the best they can. Enjoying whatever the hell life throws at them and taking it on together as both friends and families. The story itself is about revenge a mystery that leads the whole cast down a path that while being violent and dark, is just as balanced with happiness and fun. Trying to figure out what the hell is going on is the big focus, sure, and I think that when it comes to the actual plot involving the whole as a concept, the sludge and unraveling who Kaiman and the eight-headed corpse really are, it's a totally fine story. It's engaging, full of unexpected twists and extremely weird turns, all while having a silly but fun conclusion. I don't think there's honestly any way to predict where everything is gonna go. But even with the bloody, messy revenge of the story aside, Doro Hey Doro is about family, about sharing your hearts with them and literally just having fun. Life's fucking hard, dude. It's random, it's mean, and it's harsh. But just like in Doro Hey Doro, we can all push through it a lot better when we have those friends, that family to lean on. And even if shit all seems hopeless and like a sludge monster is gonna take over the world, as long as you got your people, you'll be aight. So, with all of that wrapped up, there's still the topic of the anime, how you can read the manga, and what's Hayashida up to these days. Well, on that first topic, bro, how insane is it that Doro Hey Doro even got an anime in the first place? If there's anything that should be obvious based on all the art I've shown off, animating this series to match with the manga art style would be a, uh, big challenge. And while not being perfect by any means, I think the adaptation done by MAPPA is really solid. The lead direction was done by Yuchiro Hayashi, who at this point in time has directed three anime for MAPPA, one being this, another being Kakeguri, and most famously, all 72 or whatever parts of Attack on Titan's final season. So the dude has some big clout. But all of that aside, when it comes to the actual scene direction, the flow of the combat, and the color and design of the world, it feels very Doro Hey Doro. Watsuru Takagi voices Kaiman, and that's literally the voice I would hear in my head when I read through it because that's just perfect casting. 
and little things like that elevated the manga more in my head from that connection. And that's a feeling I get from a large chunk of the anime in general. A lot of it absolutely coming from the banger, BANGER OST done by No Name. Them as a group handling the intro and multiple ending songs, as well as ROB doing the general music for the show. And every song feels like a perfect picture of what Doro Hey Doro is. They're distorted, blown out, hectic, off tempo, and deep fried. The exact feeling of manic insanity that you'd want out of it. And it adds so much to every scene they play in. No Name is an interesting group formed specifically to do anime OSTs, and while their discography isn't exactly extensive, I can confirm both this and Spy Family Season 2's music slap, so their name is a seal of quality to me now. Originally released between January to March of 2020 in Japan, it was dropped officially on American Netflix in June later that same year, and was, like I had said, how I first saw the series while waiting on that volume to deliver. After watching, I thought the first episode was really great honestly. The mystery was interesting, the world was cool, and the animation was pretty solid despite any preconceived notions about CGI. But then, that first volume arrived, and once I saw its artwork, yeah that was a wrap, I was all in on the manga from there. Think I maybe watched two more episodes, but by that point, I was already ordering books and reading on ahead, so the anime just started to fall behind. If you can't tell from my channel overall, I'm a manga dude first, have been for years, and probably always will be, and while that does not mean at all that I dislike anime or adaptation specifically, I'm just a sucker for drawn artwork, especially when it looks this good, so I couldn't really help myself. Thankfully, within the next few months, I went back and restarted watching the whole thing with zero real complaints, and have now had the OST on my phone since then, and it's in daily rotation. DDDD and Strange Meat Pie are eternal bangers. I love these tracks so much. The anime is only 12 episodes, with a short OVA that's just the first few bonus manga chapters adapted in a simple but fun style, all exclusively available on Netflix. I wish I had more to say about it, honestly, but I think it's just fine. Real shit, the stuff towards the back half is what I'd want to see animated more and would probably have more thoughts on, but season 1 stops around volume 6-ish of the manga, so it is what it is. Thankfully, as of the writing of this video, a season 2 was just kind of announced out of nowhere. No real info at all currently in February of 2024 as to who's creating it, studio or otherwise, but I'm down for what whatever's cooking up, I'll be there, count on it. Now when it comes to reading the manga itself, thankfully it does have an English print under Viz's signature Iki printing, the label they give manga that are a bit more mature than their usual Shonen Jump ass series. At the current moment of recording this, all volumes can be found easily online, one way or another. And I think it's a fine printing. In terms of the translation quality specifically, I think that is fantastic. It's vulgar and stupid, which matches the exact energy it was already putting down. Those are the translations I've used for most of this video. But I've got a personal issue that I'll complain about until I die. Volume 1 had color pages in it, so I got hype at the idea of seeing the rest of them as they came in with their volumes. But nah, Viz decided only Volume 1 deserved color pages, and the rest is monochrome black and white. You know that shitty quality that looks really bad when you just scan a color page minus the color? I hate this shit. Even the digital release only has them up until Volume 3 before it just gave up too, and that sucks. Especially when these pages are some of the most beautiful pieces of art I've looked at in a minute. But if it still says anything, I own the whole series physically with no plans on ever selling it, so I do think they're at least worth your cash I guess. And before I take off, there's the final question of, what's Hayashida up to these days? Well, shortly after the end of Doro Hey Doro, she began the serialization of a new series titled Die Dark, it having art and designs that are immediately similar to Doro Hey Doro. As for what the series is about, I don't know, and you can't make me find out! 
Yeah, I know it apparently takes place in space and is extremely sci-fi while having her tried and true artwork. And I gotta tell you, that sounds like something that was created by God itself for me specifically. Say what you will about Mashima and Eden Zero, but it's one of my most anticipated reads right now for that reason. So I'll be real, I'm saving this one as a special treat until it's either A, finished, or B, in the final arc. I know that's a little blue balling as hell, but I personally like to experience a story in one big binge most of the time, and usually just wait for them to end first. Unless it's One Piece. One Piece is something special, that doesn't count. Die Dark does have an English print done by Seven Seas. At the time of writing this, they're up to volume 6 while Japan is on 7, and I think it's a fantastic printing. Full color pages, bright whites to contrast the heavy darks, and sturdy as hell. I'll be buying all these volumes on release for 20 years until it's done, and then we'll see what's up. Thanks for watching, shout out my patrons as always, like, sub, comment, all of that shit. If you take anything away from this video, it's that we need more manga that look like this and have stories for weirdos like me, because this shit whips. See you next time with who knows what, I got like three videos in the works right now, and it's also non-stop video game release hell, so wish me luck. Like Persona 3's out, Yakuza 8's out, you see that Death Stranding 2 trailer? Final Fantasy 7, seriously, I'm fucking drowning. Goddamn video games rule, dude. Later.